we've been talking about his bizarre patterns of speech, uh, you know, his rambling sentence, fragmented speech that, you know, just seems to be wandering all over the place. You don't know where he's going, where he's been, what he's up to, nothing. You have no idea where this, this word salad uh, journey is going to take you. Uh, but evidently, he says this is on purpose. Uh, he has named his rambling uh, sentence fragmented speech as the weave. Uh, he claims to weave, you need an extraordinary memory to get back where you started. And I, I couldn't help but think, you know, this is, this is the tactic that used car salesmen use. They use it all the time. They get you all confused and all discombobulated to sell you a giant lemon. Um, is that what he's doing or is he just losing his mind? Here to share some thoughts on, well, all of that and a whole lot more. I've asked my good friend, Sarah Burris, to come share some thoughts. Sarah's a reporter over at Raw Story. RawStory.com, the website, if you want to take a look at her work. Sarah, thanks for taking time for us. Hey, how the heck are you? The weave, Sarah, the weave. It's like, tell me that you don't have any uh, black women in your life without telling me that you don't have any black women in your life, right? Like, the second he said weave, I was like, I'm pretty sure that's not the way that works. <laughs> Weave usually takes like, you know, definitely th at least three hours, right? Like <laughs> a lot of those weaves take no forever. Idea. I have no idea. But here's the weird thing. I've seen this now in a couple of places. The, the Washington Post, for instance, uh, this is with the article where I read it. The Washington Post is, is, is putting this in it. And I'm going, will this now be the justification for idle ramblings? Whereas when it was Joe Biden who was going on these these journeys, uh, it was dementia. And now it's it's the weave. Like you name it and somehow that makes it acceptable. But the thing is, it's like we've been for for people like us who've watched him nonstop since 2015, you can tell the difference. Like you really can see how he has changed over the years and how he's declined. And I think yeah. even folks like, you know, Maggie Haberman and people who are in that circle of people that he speaks to, um, either for interviews or whatever they've made it pretty clear like he is not anywhere near where he was you know when he first came into office he sure as heck isn't anywhere near where he was when he was younger and there was a there was a um a campaign ad that he put on true social last week and they had they put all of these old clips of him talking throughout the 80s and 90s and i was like god this really he, he sounds much more articulate. And so it, to me, it just emphasizes how different he is with, you know, this young person who seems to know what's happening in the world versus where he is now, where it's just a hodgepodge of nothingness. Yeah. Just, just sentence fragments of, of, you know, one dumb idea after another. And, and as, as you pointed out in one of your articles, uh, a, a speech about windmills, rabbits and, and Pocahontas uh, that's popped up. And it's what's sad about it is, and a couple of people made this connection is that old book by John Steinbeck of Mice and Men with the, the guy who's, you know, a, a little slow who can't stop petting the rabbits, you know, but he pets them too hard and then he breaks their necks. And at the end of the book, he, spoiler alert, he, um, you know, he ends up breaking this girl's neck. And, um, and so it's like, it, it kind of makes you think of Trump, like, you know, is he going to kill us all? <laughs> Maybe. Thanks for World that. War Three. I know, right? Kind of a downer. <laughs> the weird thing is, is look, you know, everyone knows that he's he's losing his mind. You've got you've got ex aides, you know, saying you know Trump's you know bizarre, uh, you know, saying ridiculous things, doing this kind of stuff. You've got a mainstream media that's ignoring it. Uh, the Washington Post, the L.A. Times, not endorsing anyone, you know, following Sean O'Brien and the Teamsters, which brings up a whole bunch of questions about either what they've got on the Washington Post and the the L.A. Times, or are they scared to death? I don't know, but it brings up a lot of questions. It does. And I kind of, I, I could go either way on this, like where the, my first initial reaction was they are thinking that this is a business decision where they think that, you know, by placating to Trump, if he is reelected, then they won't, you know, put all of their reporters in camps or whatever. Yeah. He's um, not going to, he's not going to continue yeah. to go after reporters and mock them and highlight them as the enemy. No, he won't right. do that anymore. He, he promises. He pinky swears. Yeah. 
that's the thing. And, and he, you know, I, I think I get, I get if you wanted to appeal to a larger audience. Um, I honestly don't believe that newspapers should be endorsing candidates at all. And so I understand this idea of the post wants to go back to an era where they didn't do that. I don't think that it's smart to start necessarily with the, one of the most important elections of our life, the most important election. Especially, especially Sarah, when you're, Especially when your tagline is democracy dies in darkness. Yeah. <laughs> when that's your, when, I get the wall street journal, the newspaper of the investor class perfectly right. get that. But when you're, when you're, when your statement is democracy dies in darkness and you're leading us into darkness. And the thing is about you know? when you think about the business piece of this, um, which I can completely understand if, if he wants to appeal to more people. The problem is that the, the majority of their subscribers are coming from a group that came in after 2016 and they wanted to see all of the, the Trump coverage, right? right? And they haven't had, I mean, Joe Biden is really boring. So there's not a lot of scandal and like, oh my God, that they can report on. Right. So bit in, in terms of a, a business thing, like if you have a majority of your subscribers are coming from the left, I mean, what are you thinking by making it into this huge thing where you're not going to endorse Harris over Trump? And I mean, from what I heard from somebody was something like 60,000 unsubscription, like people unsubscribed from, uh, from the post in 24 hours. Yeah. See, I disagree with that, Sarah. Because it wasn't the it wasn't the writers, it wasn't the people doing the jobs. This was the owners. This was the people at the top. This was the the head office who don't care about those workers at the bottom. Because I don't even think it was about about the Washington Post. I think it was about something much bigger than that. I think Bezos again, somebody got got, and you know Bezos learned from 2016, uh, and and didn't get the uh, uh, the cloud computing defense contractor contract that Trump awarded. Uh, that was worth like ten billion dollars. I don't think he cares about sixty thousand subscribers. I think Bezos and that ilk. I think they've got much bigger fish to fry, and whatever Trump has sold them, uh, I think they bought. I guess his lobbyist, um, or or like somebody on his campaign staff, met with the lobbyist for the um, what is the um, Blue the, Origin? Yeah, met with the Blue Origin lobbyist, um, like the day before Bezos said. We're not endorsing. Kind of, kind of got to wonder. I know. God, and this is why that you shouldn't have newspapers owned by gazillionaires. This is why this Definitely. shouldn't information should not be uh, in the purview of the extraordinarily wealthy who want more power. I don't know. Bezos and Musk owning two very powerful uh, media type outlets, uh, social media and and new and print outlets. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that's a bad place to be. I do too, and I but I hate the idea that journalism is a business, right? Like that to me, it means that they are making decisions on reporting in a business way, right? And we've talked about this because I get so hacked off about the we're whole in a COVID. Click, we're in a clickbait world, Sarah. Yeah, and 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 I mean, I I will rail against Bob Woodward and tell the cow cows come home because he didn't tell us about you know what Trump said in March of 2020 about COVID. Um, because that again was a financial decision on his part. Like this is going to sell my book um, versus it could also save a million people's lives. And so it's so frustrating to me, you know, and I don't know how, I don't know how you make it right where it's either it's a nonprofit or some sort of, you know, something, but then you're talking about being beholden to donors and it's like, I, I don't know how to fix that, yeah. but I just know that the way it's working now just seems so disingenuous. No, I, I I don't either. I, maybe it's it's publicly owned. Uh, you know, maybe it's it's you know, uh, there's got to be a way to make sure our information is is not biased for billionaires. Yeah. Just kind of a, th a thought thrown out there. Because again, I come back to uh, the Reagan quote of you know of knowing so much that isn't true, and you know I look at someone like Trump, who uh, a lot of the the messages, oh, they're pro-military. Uh, I, I got Sean O'Brien running out there saying that uh, Josh Hawley and J.D. Vance are, are pro-worker. I don't get it. But this <laughs> this idea that somehow 
uh, Trump is pro-military. And then you see this story yeah. coming out of Arlington. You see the story with, with, with John Kelly. You see the story of this soldier that uh, I guess we were going to pay for the funeral costs. We weren't going to pay for the funeral costs. We said some horrible things. That I, It's amazing to me. Yeah. So what ha what dropped this week at the Atlantic was a little bit more about, you know, Trump's horrible things that he said about um, members of the military and the key piece of it um, for me. I mean, this was all the whole story that that really everybody was talking about was, oh, he was glorifying Hitler and talking about, you know, all of the stuff that he's already said. The thing that killed me is, um, you know, he he had promised the families of um, the it was a woman at Fort Hood who was murdered by this dude that um, that was her superior and she was dealing with a lot of sexual harassment and he was worried that she was going to report him and he basically beat the hell out of her and dismembered her and um, and set her on fire and Trump brought these people to the White House and said, you know what, if, if you need help, like I will, I'm, I will, will help you with the funeral costs for something like this. Like, absolutely. I'm there. And then he got the bill in the mail and it was $60,000. And he goes, why the hell does it cost $60,000 to bury a Mexican? <laughs> Just like, wow, this guy. And the, the John Kelly story, I mean, there were a lot of John Kelly stories that dropped where he talked about, you know, again, Trump being a fascist and yada, yada. But the story that blew me away was that story of when they were in Arlington and, and Trump was looking at the graves and said, you know, what did they get out of this? What was this all for? That moment, Trump and John Kelly were standing over the grave of John Kelly's son, and again, this is just like, what, what the hell are you doing, man? Yeah. See, this is where, you know, I, I gotta be honest. I, I have, I lose a little bit of respect for John Kelly because I'll be honest. I don't care who you are and people, you know, friends know me. I I'm, I'm very much a man of my word. Uh, you say something like that over the grave of my dead son. Um, you're going to be laying next to him. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, the interesting thing I found also about John Kelly is um, one of his aides said that I think that he would have come back to the White House during COVID because he was so freaked out about what Trump was doing to the country. Um, so it's one of those things where you're like, I can see him making a very conscious decision not to sock his lights out, you know, because he's like, I don't have that kind of, I don't have that kind of self-control. Right. I, I, I don't know how you do. I and this the same story. The story it was an aide who saw John Kelly afterwards, and he was at Arlington putting flags on the graves of some of his uh, former colleagues. And he was with his five year old son. And Kelly wouldn't talk about what happened um, just before that. And his five year old, um, the the guy's five year old son, grabbed John Kelly's hand and said, "Do you want to say a prayer with me over his son's grave?" And you're just like, God from the mouths of babes, right? If that doesn't bring tears to your eyes. And also hope that that there might be a future post-Trump. And this is yeah. where, look, I, and I, I've been saying this a lot uh, since, you know, my wife was involved in, in the motorcycle action, accident that, that she's recovering from. Um, you know, people have been very gracious, very kind, uh, very nice, very thoughtful. Uh, all of that, you know, ho thoughts and prayers, vibes, good juju, whatever. We're getting a lot of those sentiments. So it tells me there's still, still as bad as we think things can be, there's something that can unite us. We just have to find what it is. And I don't want it to be tragedy. I don't want yeah. it to be the horrible. But unfortunately, you know, the more we hear about Trump, the more we hear the things that he does, the more I'm hoping something's going on in people's heads going, yeah, this isn't where we want to be. This isn't who we are. Yeah. And, you know, I keep telling you over and over, the thing that always gets me is that is the thing from um, Mr. Rogers, where he said, when terrible things happen, look for the helpers because the helpers are always there. The problem is a terrible thing has to happen. Right. Yeah. So uh, that's that's the that's the hard part here. And hopefully, uh, you know, come come next Tuesday. Um we make the right choice. This is just my thought. Now, interesting, interesting bit. Uh, I keep hearing about, uh, again, you know, if Trump wins, there's some talk he might not be able to pass a, a background check. So, yes and no. The thing is, is that if you are the president, you automatically 
are are given you know clearance to everything that you want and sure, he, sure. right i mean that uh, uh, is a little bit right like you're <laughs> you stole classified documents and were on trial for it and now um you know the cancellation of that trial is being appealed at the 11th circuit like i, right. I think we there's enough information here for us to perhaps pause um but yeah it will be automatically given to him regardless of any of his problems of which there are many not just the classified documents but his relationships with foreign leaders and at all all right well we'll see uh i gotta i gotta tell you there's gotta be a point in which you go look what he did before uh but i guess again that's on us uh, to make sure that he doesn't get back in there to get there. So lastly, uh, Halloween's on its way. Uh, Musk is dressing up as a uh, as a human, I guess, uh, out there doing campaign events. Going to be back in Harrisburg here, I guess, some point in the next couple of days, uh, handing out checks. Uh, but I guess he, uh, I guess he, he he could get himself in a little trouble over uh, that political stunt, over that stunty poll. Yeah, that's the one of his problems is that you the law says that you can't pay somebody or give a gift to somebody to um, incentivize them to register to vote or to vote. Um, and so the the Justice Department sent him a little warning letter, um, which generally is also the DOJ saying, congratulations, you're now under investigation. But the DOJ doesn't confirm whether or not there is an investigation. Or, deny. Um, or any other inf uh, information about it. So, I mean, it may very well be that he uh, is going to end up having to pay a whole heck of a lot of money um, for the he cash that he's handing out. He doesn't care. He'll just take it from his workers. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, the, one, the, the ones that he'll fire if they go on strike. Again, <laughs> thank you, Sean O'Brien. Um, but, Sarah, I appreciate the time. As always, great work. I hope folks will check out the website, Raw Story. RawStory.com is where you go to find Sarah Burris's work. Sarah, thanks so much. Have an awesome week, everyone. Uh, as always, good stuff. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the rick Show.com. 